How many people in here um, have signed up for the daily walk? Just raise your hand. Great. Um, how many people in here? Well, we are going to make a very quick announcement. This is uh, you could sign up again today for eighteen dollars. You can get the daily walk sent to your house, and if you're here from out of town, we'll send it to you there. Uh, just whatever your address is, I assume will still work. But we are also going to start Rock University, and we're going to make a very quick announcement about that. How many have not seen Rock University on, on the uh, here to, as an announcement? Anybody? Just raise your hand. So we're going to do this for five people. Who will do this real quick? That's okay. We want to make sure you're informed, brother. And uh, Rock University is going to be a supplement to our daily reading. This is going to be on the internet, and we will be through Rock University teaching you uh, the books of the Bible. You see it says Genesis, Book of Beginnings. You could scroll up. It says Genesis book of, well, the same, there's only one way, you know, put the, there you go, okay, Genesis book of beginnings, and, uh, and then we'll have a chapter overview, a life application to each book, uh, we'll have a Bible difficulty for each book every week, a Bible uh, trivia for every week of reading, um, and if you look at where it says Genesis in red, and next to it, it says Book of Beginnings. If you hit on one of those brown buttons, it will tell you more information pertaining to whatever that question is. And there's 10 things that began in Genesis as a little quiz. And if you hit on that next button, they'll tell you the answers uh, and where they're found in the Bible. So uh, this, again, if no matter where you're at in the country or world, we had uh, someone in the military go to the Persian Gulf last week. And he's going to be doing this uh, in the Persian Gulf with guys in his unit and uh, in, the, in the Navy. So it doesn't matter where you're at, this will be on the internet and we're gonna learn all the books of the Bible. Go down to the bottom where it has the books of the Bible because the, every week, month we'll learn about five or six books from the Bible. And, uh, but I wanna show you the whole list. We're gonna learn all these books of the Bible, what they all mean, learn them in order, etc. So you are going to be uh, you know, a Bible whiz, amen? What's the first book of the Bible? It is the book of? Book of Beginnings, okay? And things that began in Genesis were life, death, sin, pain and childbirth, weeds, sin, death, murder, dreams, uh, marriage, all kind of stuff began in Genesis and um, uh, the religions of the world. So we'll learn all this stuff about the Bible. And like I said, by next year, this time, you will be... Um, Sharing with your friends more confidently. Amen. Okay, let's see your Bibles this morning. Word. And let's see your pens. There we go, the pen. And your bulletins. Get out your bulletins and get your notes ready for your bulletins. And turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. Do we have any Kenny G fans in here? Okay, amen. And uh, got the, his new Christmas album. It's, it's amazing how he can play the same old songs we hear all the time and it sounds so good. But um, uh, in the last song on his new album, it is a, the New Year's Eve song Oh, 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 Lang Syne. How do you say that? Oh, Ang Syne. Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Da, na, 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 na. Okay, so he's playing this song. And during the song, he has these um, announcements, radio announcements, television announcements of things that have happened over the last hundred years. But the actual announcement, uh, example, he would have... Uh, when the stock market crashed, he would have the announcement that was on the radio. He would have uh, Muhammad Ali talking trash and, and um, uh, Marilyn Monroe singing a song, and then an announcement that she was killed and, and Kennedy being killed and Martin Luther King being killed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that said is, uh, um, I think I believe it was President Kennedy, he's on preaching or, or giving a speech, and he says this, and I want to read this to you because I, I always forget it. He said, men see things that are and say why. I dream things that never been and say why not. 
Men see things that are and say, why? In other words, we could look at the world, you could look at your life, you could look at San Diego, your family, whatever, and say, why, and complain. Or you can dream things that have never been and say, why not? Okay? People who dream and accept the vision from God or dream things that have never been and say, why not, and have the courage to pursue that are the people who invent things, the people who make the world different. That, that's a fact. You don't stumble on greatness. You dream it and you work for it. And it is hard work and it takes sacrifice. Amen? If you don't believe that, it's maybe because you've never done that before. Maybe you've lived in a world of comfort all your life. You don't take risks. You're scared of rejection. So you do everything safe and everything that you know everyone around you will accept. But that is boring. Okay? And, I, and, and let me take back the word boring. God will not have you live that way. And what I mean by that is not that you have to take risk and you have to be out there, but if you are going to walk with God, he is always going to call you outside of your comfort zone. That's a fact. He wants you to live outside the box. So if you're one of those people who say, you know, I, I got to have it this way, let me tell you something. Christ would say, get ready for a ride. You have to be ready to go with me because where I'm going to call you, you've never been and you will never go on your own. And what God will ever a challenge you to do and, and have you think, Believe is not something you would normally do. That's why you have to get saved. I was at the ballet yesterday at the, at the opera. This was the ballet. It was, it's like the opera, you know, but uh, it was my daughter's in Nutcracker down at um, Spreckles Theater. Okay. And she was uh, uh, in it. And there was a guy, one of the other ballerinas' father, who I see all the time. He's a minister. And we were talking about his church and his pastor, da, 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 da. And he said, and I said, what's your, what's your pastor preaching on? And he said, well, last week he preached a sermon that the title was, you're too stupid to know what you want. <laughs> and, and, and I was just dying laughing because, I, you know, I always love to hear what preachers and, you know, what they're, what they're preaching on. But we were talking about how if when you have a title on your sermon, if, if you can't figure it out, the title from what, if you can't figure out what the sermon's about from the title, it's too complicated. And when, when the pastor says, I'm going to preach on today that you're too stupid to know what you want, you really want. You know, we are. We're too stupid to know what we want because, we, you know, we want this, we want that. We think, we think our way. God's like up here. So what I want to talk about today is something that is up here, okay? Something that hopefully you are challenged to do, and it's prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. And how many people in here have ever gone on a fast in their life? Raise your hand. Very good. How many people have gone on a fast longer than three days, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, 40 days? Very good. It's about ten, five of y'all in here have been on a 40-day fast. Very good. Okay. How many people in here are scared to fast? You think, ah, oh, 40 days, I'm going to. How many people in here would think 40-day fast is out of the question? Just raise your hand. There you go. Very good. <laughs> how many people in here would think 30 days is out of the question? 20, 10, out of the question. Okay. Okay, that's okay. 40-day fast is not for everybody, but what I'm going to talk about today is going on a 40-day fast. Now, let me, understand, let me understand this. I am not telling you this to challenge you to go on a 40-day fast. I'm speaking about this because this is what I did, and so I have to talk from that perspective, okay? Because if you go on a 5-day fast, it's a lot different than a 40. A lot of different things you experience before, during, and after. So I'm going to talk about the big picture just in case someone wants to go on because at the end of the message today, I'm going to challenge all of you to go on a fast starting today. But here's the fact. It's only going to be one day. Can we all do one day? We can do one day. Okay? Oh, I can't. I can't. <laughs> you can do one day. Unless you have some medical problems, you can do one day. But some of you today, some of you are going to say, listen, I want to go longer. And the day after Christmas, because I know the next week, a couple, you know, we, we're going to be a lot of parties and stuff. So, you know, we, we get past that. But the day after Christmas, if you want to go on a longer fast, we're going to start the day after Christmas. Okay? And we told the first service, and we're going to pray for the church. We're going to pray for a building. We're going to pray for ourselves, all that kind of stuff. Okay? All right? It could be a week. It could be a month. It could be, you know, if you go, if you go longer than eight days and you're into the new year, you can say, I haven't eaten all year. It sounds good, huh? I'm the man. Now, if you're saying that in March, then we got issues, you know. But uh, okay, but but let me, let me read something to you. Let me read something to you. Matthew six six sixteen. It 
says, Jesus is speaking, moreover, he, he, right before he talks about the Lord's Prayer, and then he says, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, you they have their reward. Now, the second word in a sentence is what? Everybody say when. when. Say when. when. Now, Jesus didn't say, if you fast. He said, when you fast. Now, do I believe that everyone's supposed to fast? I do. Do I believe everyone's supposed to fast 40 days? Not necessarily. But I do believe that we are called to fast. Turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. What are the four gospel books? Matthew? Okay, say so this again. Matthew? Okay, the third one is Luke. Okay, what are they again? Very good. Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is the third one. Uh, second one. Matthew, Mark. Look what it says. Verse 29. Jesus just cast out a demon of a boy. He just cast out a demon. His disciples didn't know, understand why they couldn't do it. And in verse 29, he says, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, I want you to just, just imagine, if you've never read this in the Bible, just listen very closely but, and believe me because I wouldn't lie to you on Sunday. Every time, <laughs> every time Jesus did a miracle in the Bible, I want to say every time, but I can't think of one time that this doesn't apply, he would say a very short prayer. And in this particular case, he said 17 words in the New King James. He says, you deaf, dumb spirit, I command you get out of him and enter him no more. 17 words. And a demon left his boy. He told the storm when he was on the, on the sea, be muzzled. He told demons and another uh, demon-possessed person, be gone. He told the little girl, she was dead, 12 years old, Talitha Kumai, raise up little girl. He told Lazarus, who was dead, Lazarus, come forth. Miracle after miracle. He, he prayed very short prayers, and these incredible things happened. Why? Because he prayed and fasted all the time. He walked around ready. He walked around ready. He was spending all night in prayer. Many times in the Bible it says he went to a, a, a solitary place to be alone and prayed all night or spent all night in prayer. So he's saying here, you can't do this unless you pray and you fast and you deny yourself. And so that's how you're going to get the power. You will not get this kind of power just going to church once a week, reading your Bible every now and then, and saying prayer for food. It ain't going to happen. He says, you've got to spend your time in prayer. You've got to fast and pray. That has to be your lifestyle. That has to be your lifestyle. And the, the reason that we struggle with these little same old deals that the devil trips us up with is because one of the reasons we don't fast, deny ourselves, and pray. Now, the definition of fasting is to voluntarily abstain from something. We're going to talk about food. Voluntarily abstaining from food. Okay, now, you can fast television. You can fast talking on the phone. You can fast ESPN. You can fast hanging out. You can fast just solid food and just drink juices. You can fast all foods, even juices, and just drink water. So you can fast anything you want. So when we start this fast today, it can be anything you want. But the challenge for today is that you are going to voluntarily abstain from something just so you can spend more time with God and so God can have more his way with you. Okay? So again, you can fast anything you want. You only have to watch Sports Center one time a day. You only have to watch CNN one time of the day, and you'll get the same news at night as you'll get in the morning. Think about it. November 7th, we had an election, and I figured, okay, I'm not going to watch the whole thing on TV. I'll wait till the evening and get the, the bottom line. Who won? <laughs> Five weeks later, I'm still trying to get the bottom line. <laughs> but you know what? You could save yourself all the headache of spending hours and hours listening to Gre Greta Van Susteren. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? Who's, what, what lawyer's going to do? Is what and it's like, you know what God's saying? Why don't you spend time with me? You can spend that time with me. So I want you to be thinking about what you're going to abstain from. Uh, um, the, Paul talks about husband and wife abstaining from sexual relations for a time, for a time, just so they can fast and pray. 
and then come together so they won't be tempted. The Bible talks about in Judges how they fasted in times of war. Judges chapter 20, verse 26. Jonah called a fast on Nineveh, or they called a fast to repent of their sin. You could fast to repent. Uh, in Ezra, they fasted in times of danger. Esther, when she was going to approach the king, she asked them to fast so she could have wisdom and courage. David called the fast because he was in distress over the death of Saul and Jonathan. Jesus, as we've just read, said you have to fast and pray if you want power. Uh, Daniel fasted in chapter 10 when he was mourning, during a time of mourning. Moses fasted when he went for special revelation. He fasted to get the word of God uh, or when he got the, the law. Uh, Elijah fasted 40 days and 40 nights after he killed the prophets of Baal. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights when he fought the devil in the desert. All throughout the Bible, people fasted for a lot of different reasons. So you can fast for a lot of different reasons. It is biblical. And all of God's giants fasted. All his giants fasted. Um, uh, why are you going to fast? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but there's one main reason. Uh, when I went on my four-day fast, a guy asked me, why are you doing it? And I said, well, Jesus fasted 40 days. And he said, Jesus was trying to be like God. I said, well, so am I. Your mission in life is to be like God. In, in, case, you, in case you didn't know, the word Christian means little Christ. So that's what you should be. That's your mission in life, to be like God. Okay, and the only way you could be like God is if God takes over. You're not going to figure it out and say, okay, I'm going to do this, do this. God is going to take over and speak to you. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Big Fat Egghead back together again. <laughs> I don't know why a horse would try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but, you know, I, if you think about it, why was a horse, you know, he's kicking him, I don't know. Humpty Dumpty didn't need the king's horses, and he didn't need the king's men. Humpty Dumpty needed the king. You don't need the king's horses, and you don't need the king's men. You need the king of kings. That's who you need. So when you fast, what you're saying is, God, I don't need this. I don't need that. I am coming directly to you with no distractions because I want you. That's why you fast. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Hebrews, James, Peter. And there's two Peters, the first Peter and the second Peter. How many Peters are there? What is an epistle? Say an epistle is a letter. Okay. Are you guys awake this morning? Okay. Okay. First Peter is a letter. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, 16 says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Why are you going to fast? To be holy. Don't talk to me about being a good person, because you're not a good person. I'm not a good person. The Bible says there's no, none good, no, not one. No, I want to be holy. Now, that's better than good. But it's something only God can do. And only God can do when I surrender myself to him. It's not because I figured it out. So part of this process, uh, reason of fasting is being holy. Turn to Matthew, first book of the Gospels, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I was teaching this at a church in Northern California many years ago. And um, this one, I think he was 19 years old, kid raised his hand. He said, what does food have to do with being holy and spiritual? I said, stop eating and find out. <laughs> you know what? You could try to figure it out all you want, but until you stop eating and until you say, God, I'm giving up food, you won't really, really know. Now, you may be able to say, yeah, I can see how that may work. But you won't really know until you do it. Now, I want you to imagine this. When you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you think about? Food, coffee, oh, yeah, coffee, okay? I, I'm not a coffee guy, but yeah, I know. A lot of people think, give them a coffee. Okay, once you finish eating that, what's the next thing you think about? Next time you're going to eat. <laughs> and when you finish eating that, What's the next thing you think about after that? Next time, what you going to have for dinner? 
We prepare food. We cook it. We marinate it. We fry it. We bake it. We toast it. We latte and frate and frap it. We do all this stuff. <laughs> we, that's a frappuccino thing. We do all that stuff to prepare our food. Then we rest from the eating the food. We feel fat from eating the food. Then we feel guilty from eating the food. Then we run and we eat some mofo. <laughs> my, uh, my father called me the other day. He lives in Florida. And he says, did you guys get a box of cookies? And we said, you know, big, he said, no. He says, because I ordered a box of cookies, and it, I think I might have given the wrong address. It didn't come to my house. So I'm thinking, did it come to your house? So we said no, and... So it was like two days ago, he's telling us my wife. So uh, I'm talking to him yesterday, and he's, he goes on another stuff and he's talking, talking about how, how much he weighs. Man, I'm so heavy, I'm so heavy. And he tells me how much he weighs, and my wife's in the background going, then why are you ordering a box of cookies? <laughs> Even when we don't need it, we eat it. Can I get an Amen. Now, yeah, look at all these hungry people. <laughs> we got some cookies outside for sale right now. <laughs> every day you wake up, and this is true for every, all of us, it is so much easier for us to go without praying than without eating. I mean, we can put God on hold Real quick. Amen? Oh, yeah, I, I got to go. I got to go. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray. I got to go. 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 I got go. I got to go. Okay, I'm hungry. Everything's got to stop. I got to get something to eat, okay? But when God's like, you know, spend time with me. No, God, I got, I got work to do. Okay, so it's a lot easier for us to put God on hold than food on hold. Therefore, God, and you know what that says? That food is a higher priority in our life. The highest, one of the highest. How many of us get grumpy when we, get, when we don't have food? On this one? Ooh, man. All these Grinches in here. If you remove what's at the top of your list as priority, and you may not realize it's as high as a priority as it is until you start removing it. But when you say, I'm not going to eat, and you successfully come to a realization that you can survive and be happy without this, because that will happen, by the way. Guess what happens? You start to realize that you don't have to be, you don't need what's number two on your priority list. Number three, number four, number five. What are those, some of those things? Pat on the back. This person telling you you're cute. This person telling you you're good at what you do. This person's affirmation, cars being first in line. You know, some of us have to be first in line. You know, <laughs> have to have your way, have to get the clothes you want, the hairstyle you want. You realize that all these things that you're sensitive about and irritable about, you don't need anymore. Sex, your, your concept of being loved, because what happens is, once you drop off the number one on the list, like dominoes, all the other things fall. And what are you left with? God. Because he's not going anywhere. Look what it says in Matthew 6.33. Let's, let's start at 31. It says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry about what you eat, about what you drink, about what you wear. For all these things the non-believer seek, the ones who don't trust God, the ones who are self-sufficient. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But here's what you do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So instead of worrying about your food, your clothes, your house, your car, your retirement, the stock market, I want you to worry about me. I'll do all that other stuff. This is so hard for people to accept and believe. I'll take care of all your needs. 
Don't try to do it yourself. I have not called you to try to do it yourself. I've called you to obey me and trust me and lay your life down at my feet. That's what I've called you to do. I will do it because when I do it, one, it's going to be better than what you can do, and I'm going to get the glory. That's what he says. So don't worry about it. Now, now when it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, you know what the kingdom of God is? The kingdom of God is where God has control. It's where God is in control. Now, this country technically became the kingdom of Bush. Okay, he's the boss now. Whether you agree or not, it's not the issue, but he's the president. Now, even though we all know the president does have the ultimate power, he got Congress and all that kind of stuff, but he's not the kingdom of Iraq. That's Solomon Sain's kingdom. Okay, where is God's kingdom? Where he has control? And he's saying here, seek my control in your life and my righteousness in your life. And if you do that, I'll take care of everything else. This is a fact. So instead of looking at the food, if God can remove food and all these other things, and all you're left with is God reigning and ruling and controlling your life, then you won't worry about a thing. You really, really won't. I went to a soccer game yesterday. My son was in a soccer game, and we got there just as the game was starting, and he was on the field. And we were walking up behind him. He didn't know he was there, oh, that we were there, and he kept looking. And my wife said, look, he's looking for us. I hope he was looking for us. <laughs> All he cared about was, is my dad there, my mom. Excuse me. Went to ballet thing yesterday at the Spreckles Theater. You know, I, I don't know if you all go to ballet and operas. I'm not really that, that cultured. You know the guy in the orchestra, the orchestra conductor? Is it a conductor? He comes up and everyone claps. And my son said, why do they got to clap when he walks up there? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just clap for him. You know, he's making him feel good. He's walking up. They got a tuxedo on. Make him, he looks good. Make him feel good. <laughs> well, you can't take pictures of the, at the ballet thing. Think about that. You can't take pictures of your own kids. That's bogus. And the guy behind me is taking pictures in the usher. You know, this is in ballet. You don't say anything. You're quiet. You just clap. You're quiet. You clap. No one talks. No one talks. My daughter comes out. I'm thinking like, Kelly, yeah. You know, I'm thinking, that's my kid. That's my kid. But I can't say that. You know, I gotta, just got to go, there she is, there she is. You got to be quiet. So the, the, the usher comes up and says, no more pictures. I'm thinking, man, that's weak. You know what? As parents, we want pictures of our kids, and as kids, we want the approval of our parents. That's what God says. Seek my approval. Seek my approval because I want to bless you, me and you. Don't let all this other stuff get in the way. Don't let all these, these perceived necessities in your life, and if I can show you that even food is not a necessity all the time, guess what? Then you realize that everything else is not a necessity, and that's a fact. Before you fast, turn to, turn to uh, 1 John, all the way in the back of the book. Revelation, go backwards. Revelation, Jude, John 3, John 2, John 1. Okay, this is 1 John, not the gospel, John. This is a different John. I mean, different John letter. John, 1 John, chapter 1. First thing you should do. Before you fast, confess your sin, baby. First John chapter 8, I mean chapter 1, verse 8. First John 1, 8, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you say you have no sin or don't have a lot, you are deceived. Not only are you deceived of the fact that you have sin, you're deceived of how much sin you got. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible says your heart wants to sin. So bad, it blinds you from it that it doesn't even, it blinds you from the fact of how evil it is. You ever notice that when you uh, talk to somebody with bad breath? We all talk to people with bad breath. Amen? And you're talking to them with bad breath, and their breath is like killing you. Your eyes are watering, your eyebrows are just burning up. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And you're trying to breathe out as they breathe, you know, <laughs> time it so. <laughs> you're like, hi. 
Okay. You ever wonder why? I mean, let's, let's talk here. Let's, you know, let's talk. We're friends. You ever wonder why they don't realize how funky their breath is like you do? Like, how come they ain't not going? <laughs> Here's why. It's because we smell our breath all the time and we are so used to it. Think about it. I mean, your nose is right there. Your breath, it's got it. You got it. It's all up in here, right? But you're so accustomed to it that it's like no big deal. Sin is the same way. You sin, 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 sin. I mean, you're an idiot. And you don't even realize it because you're so accustomed to being an idiot. And, and I say that because I'm guilty of that too. There's, everyone has, has a little idiot factor in our life. Amen? Amen? We do. Just accept it. It's a fact. If you think I'm telling, not telling you the truth, read verse 8. If you think you don't have sin, you're deceived. The problem is, is that we believe the deception so much that we don't seek God. But look what it says, verse 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So before you fast, say, God, reveal to me my unknown sin, the Bible says. Show me the stuff that I'm blind, the blind spots in my character, in my life. Okay? Um, before you fast, uh, physically, and again, this is, let me give you some hints if you want to do this. If you're going to go on a fast of, you know, a week or so, spend a couple days, two or three days, eating a lot of fruit and vegetables. And what that does is it cleanses your body out. You may even eat prunes, anything that will cleanse you. And the reason being is that when you go on a fast and you stop eating for an extended period of time, your body will start to feed on itself. Which it's doing anyway all the time. That's why people have bad breath. That's why you sweat. Your body's always cleansing itself all the time. Uh, that's why you go to the bathroom. It's always ridding itself of toxins. When you stop eating and you stop the digestive process, now you have all the stuff in you that your body's going to feed on. And so it's good to get as much of that out of you as possible. So if you want to go on an extended fast, and, and, and let me encourage you, consult your physician just to cover uh, myself. If some of you may have conditions uh, that a fast may, it may uh, make worse, so you want to be careful if you've had some kind of medical problems. But before you fast, to so go two or three or four days eating fruit and vegetables, clean yourself out, it also is going to condition you to a smaller diet. Now let me say this, there's a thing called a Daniel fast where you spend three weeks eating fruit and vegetables. If you spent several days or however long just eating fruit and vegetables, you will notice an amazing change in your relationship with God from that. And, and, and again, you could eat food if you want to just have a, have a chicken Caesar salad. I mean, if that's what you choose. That's fine. But if you just did that and you stopped eating everything else, a lot of fluids, and you ate vegetables and fruit for an extent, raw, whatever you want to do, but you just ate something simple like that, you would notice a change with your relationship with God and your pre the presence of God in your life. Because I've done it. it. It works. Now, if you cut that out and then went to just juices, you would notice another change. If you cut that out and you went just to water, <laughs> you will notice a big change. It, it is such a difference between juices and water. I, I went on a, um, when I did 40 days, I, I did juices. But when I, one time I went on like a three-day fast and just water, woo, I was hurting. And I had one glass of apple juice. And I felt like I ate a steak. I was so full just from apple juice. And it is amazing uh, uh, the difference. But if, before you go, clean yourself out. Understand, uh, uh, clean yourself out. Next thing is check your motives. Now, if your motive is, Lord, I want to be blessed, my encouragement to you is to fast anyway. If your motive is, uh, I just want to, you know, I'm going to impress my girlfriend. You know what I say? Go ahead and fast anyway. And here's why. You can't fake God. And you can't fake fasting. I mean, how are you going to fake it? Oh, I'm not fasting. <laughs> I mean, either you're eating or you're not eating. But here's why I say do it anyway. Because when you fast, what you're telling God is, God, I am removing these distractions from my life, and I'm giving my heart to you so I can have your undivided attention. That is a good thing to do anytime. Because what God's going to do in the midst of you giving your heart to him and it misses you 
trying to be focused on him, he's going to change your attitude. He's going to mold and adjust your attitude. And you can't force God to bless you. It's not like he's looking at you fast and saying, now I got to bless them. It doesn't work that way. He knows if your heart's serious, but he will change your heart. He will adjust your heart. If you say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to have selfish motives. Let me tell you something. God will adjust your selfishness because you will either punk out and start eating or you're going to change. And if you change, that's good. If you punk out and start eating, then you realize, you know what? I had the wrong attitude. No big deal. But the devil doesn't want you to fast under any condition. And he will trick you every way he can because he knows fasting and prayer is probably the most powerful thing you can do. So I say, dude, that's like saying, I'm not going to go to church and read my Bible until I am perfect because I'm not ready. No, you go to church and read your Bible so you can be perfected. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. The other thing about fasting is uh, um, uh, turn to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. You're not going to believe this, but I have to tell it to you anyway. Matthew 4. What's the first gospel in the Bible? Everybody say Matthew, please. Everybody say Matthew. Matthew. Very good. Okay. I'm going to give you a little, uh, a pa- how many parents in here? Just raise your hand if you're a parent. Great. I'm going to give you a little parenting tip. This is for free. This doesn't have to do with this uh, um, topic, but I'm just going to throw this in there. In, Ma- in chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus is getting baptized, and he says... Permit it to be so now, for this, thus is, it is fitting for us to fulfill our righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now watch this. Oh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me just keep reading one more verse. Verse 1. Then Jesus went up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, Jesus is getting ready to go be tempted by the devil, right? This is the biggest battle of his life. Jesus and the devil himself, 40 days he's going to fast. He's going to fight the devil himself head on. Right before that, he gets baptized. And right after he gets baptized, the heavens open up. A dove, the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove. I don't know what it looked like, but that must have been amazing. And then a voice comes, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Let's do it again. I got a different voice. This is my son. <laughs> that was good. What does he say, though? I want everybody to know I love my son. I want everybody to know I believe in my son. I want everybody to know I'm behind my son. Encourage your kids in public and discipline them in private. Encourage your kids in public so everybody can hear. And not only that, especially when they're going to have a big challenge in front of them. Encourage them. Just a little parenting note just for free. Like I said, I'm not going to charge you for that one. (laughs) But look what it says in verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Duh. <laughs> now, the uh, Muslims are fasting. It's, it's Ramadan. I don't know if it's over yet, but they fast 30 days, and they fast sun up to sun down. But they eat before the sun comes up, and they are allowed to eat after the sun goes down. Okay, that is a fast, but that's not the fast I'm talking about. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And not 40 days, and then when that was over, 40 nights. He did it all at the same time. You see what I'm saying? You see why they wrote that in there? Because he wants you to know, this was a 24-hour fast, 40 consecutive days he did not eat. But then it says, look what it says, afterwards. See what it says? Afterwards. See what it says? Afterwards. One more time. See what it says? Afterwards, he was hungry. Hungry. 
Now, you know how, like, you know, in the middle, when you wake up, you're hungry, you feel like a little like hunger pains, or everyone has a different part of the day where you, you go, oh, and you, I got to eat, I got to eat, and you, and you get irritated, and you, you want to eat. You know what I'm talking about? When you fast 40 days, that doesn't get worse by the day. It doesn't. What you experience on a daily basis is just about as bad as it ever gets, at least my experience and the people I've talked to. Because what happens after you get to a certain point, there's no food in your stomach, there's no, there's no uh, uh, cycle of, I want my food now. Where's my food? It's 12 o'clock. That whole cycle, psychologically, physiologically, emotionally, socially, is gone. Now you're just running on fumes. Me and God. So what happens is that, uh, when it comes, drink a little water, drink a little juice, drink a little tea, boom, dealt with. And you learn to live with a little slight hunger to no hunger, and you realize it's not a big deal. Because you know what? Instead of going like this, real high and intense, it just goes a little bit down, a little bit down. And you learn to live there. And guess what? You learn to deal with it. And you learn to trust more in the Holy Spirit's power and his strength than anything else. So that's why you have to realize before you fast or during your fast, you, you're not going to get as hungry, intense, hungry, and be walk around going, oh, I've got 10 more days to be a spiritual, be a God, and spend the time together, quality time. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I was, uh, you know, Jeff and Jay show? I don't, I, don't, I don't listen to it a heck of a whole holly ever, but Jeff is a, is a Christian, and I know him, and, and he went on a 30-day fast. I think it was last year, and I, we know each other, and he knew me when I went on my 40-day fast, so they called me up to be on the show to talk about it. So they said, we have Miles McPherson, former charger. He went on a 40-day fast. You know, they're like, whoa. They said, we have him on the line, so we're going to ask him what it was like. But first, we have and some lady, it was a fake, but it was like, you know, Dorothy on the phone. She's on day 90 of some crazy mess, right? So they said, Dorothy, how's it going? And she goes, oh, it's going great. And so I'm, I'm on the phone listening to this, right? I'm cracking up. So they go, okay, now we have Miles Fierce, the former charger, you know, the minister. Miles, uh, so you went on a four-day fast. Tell us what it was like. And I went, oh, it was so bad. <laughs> you know what? That is not going to happen. The last 10 days of my four-day fast, I was on the road traveling, speaking every day. I went to three different cities. Um, I spent the last six days in Marion, Indiana, in a hotel. I was speaking like two or three times a day. On day 39, I spoke two or three times, flew back day 40, and spoke that night here in San Diego. I exercise regularly, which, matter of fact, if you go on a fast, it is highly recommended to exercise, to get air, sun, to just get exercise so your body can breathe and continue to rid itself of toxins. But one of the things you have to understand is that when you fast, you have to expect miracles. You have to expect a miracle in your relationship with God. You have to expect to hear things you would never hear, see things you've never seen, think things you would never think. Because all of a sudden, now you're removing all these carnal, sinful, worldly distractions from your life, from your mind, and it's just you and God. You can have someone talk to you about it all day like I'm talking to you now, but until you do it and experience God, and experience God speak to you more clearly than you ever heard him before. And then you have the faith to obey him like you never have before. It won't be until you fast. It won't be until you fast. The story about Peter getting out of the boat, if you remember, he stepped out of the boat and he started walking. When you fast, you're stepping out of the boat. And the longer your fast goes, the longer you, the further away from that boat you walk. And you find yourself out in the middle of the sea, no boat around. And you say, you know what, I can do it because God and I, God is carrying me. God is carrying me. He is amazing. Uh, when you fast, a good thing to do is to change your schedule. That, that you are not around people who are eating. Um, you know, people going out to lunch, you say, no, I don't want to go. If people are eating, the only, the only bad thing about it is that it, you break fellowship with people. Because I notice when I fast, I, you know, my, my connection with my family, they're eating and I'm not. And so that's, the, that's one of the negatives. But you just take that in consideration and say, during this time, this is the way it's going to be. Um, 
But if you have friends and they're going out, don't go out. Stay home and pray. It's no big deal. Trust me, your life will not be uh, ruined. Uh, when you fast, it's important to get a place that you are going to meet with God. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, I'll just read this to you or just tell you a story. Samuel was laying in bed and he heard God speak to him three times. And Eli, his mentor, told him to go to your place. And when you hear that voice, say, speak, Lord, your servant listens. So have a place that you go to, that you are going to hear God, that you are going to write notes down, that you are going to read your Bible, and that you are going to spend with God. A specific place and a specific time, whether it be one, two, three times a day, and be there consistently. Important thing when you fast is that during your fast, God is going to say things to you you've never heard. He is going to encourage you to change and make changes in your life you would have never thought to make before. The key thing is when your fast is over to not forget what those things are. That's why you got to write them down. And when you finish your fast, and if you're going a long fast, when it's done, you are going to be depressed. Now, if you go on a two-day fast, probably not a big deal. But if you go on a week, two weeks, a month, 40 days, longer, the longer you go, the more intense that letdown is going to be because, let's think about it, you spent that much time getting closer and closer and closer to God like never before, and all of a sudden you eat, and whoosh, he's gone. That's what this, he's not really gone, but that's what you feel, you sense, he's gone. My intimacy that I had so close is not there anymore. Now, he's still there. His promises are still true. His, his faithfulness has not changed, but your, your perception of his presence and closeness changes the minute you swallow something and then you go I just became dependent on the seen world again and not the unseen and that's what depresses you the trick is not to believe the lie because the devil's saying hey God's gone you just let him down you turn your back on him that's not true but that's what you feel the key thing is to write down here's what God told me I'm going to believe this I'm going to trust him and I'm going to walk with him. But during that fast, you have to be sensitive, super sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because God is going to make changes in your life. He's going to speak things to you. He's going to guide and direct you. He's going to tell you to make decisions. You're going to be like, man, he's going to do stuff in your life. When I went to um, the desert, I went to the desert to try to be alone. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine went out and we, we decided to separate ourselves from each other for over a day. And he, he's a camping, you know, animal planet, alligator, crocodile hunter type dude. And I am not. I am one from television, but to do it, that ain't my thing. So he got me a tent. I got my three-hour Duraflame log and uh, got my little spot. And I was going to sit there and try to hear God. Right? I'm, and for me to sit still for 20 minutes is very difficult. So uh, I go out there and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going I'm to see God. I'm going to hear God. I go out there. I make my tent. I unpack my car. I pack a backpack and I climb this mountain. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I climb the mountain. Then I'm looking for animals and I'm playing war games with nobody. And then I'm looking at my watch. <laughs> How much time? 23 hours and 30 minutes left. <laughs> God says, I want you to sit and listen to me. Well, and then 25 hours, I don't think I slept the whole time. I was up all night, scared to death. It was scary out there. <laughs> you could hear the coyotes. Oh, I'm going to get you. <laughs> Mommy. The only thing I heard, though, other than those coyotes, was the wind. <laughs> and then when it stopped, I'd be like, waiting for it, because I knew it was coming back. Sometimes it would come from over there. Sometimes it would come from over there. 
Sometimes it would come from over there. Sometimes I didn't know where it came from, but I would wait and I would, and then, I would, then it would come. And then it would go away. That's how the Holy Spirit is. That's how one who's born again is. He's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it goes. When you fast, what you're telling God is God, I want to be in tune with that wind. I don't want to be in tune with the world. I don't want to be in tune with what people say. I don't want to be held down with the, with the media, whether the Dow is up or the Dow is down. I want to be in tune with. And when you fast, you have to be saying, you have to be willing to listen to that spirit and obey that spirit and allow God to do what he's going to do in your life. Here's your homework. Here's your homework. How many would like to go on some kind of fast? Very good. Okay. All we're going to do for one day, okay, starting today, you could start right now. You could start after dinner or your late night snack or your late, late snack, whatever, (laughs) y'all. We all got a little stash, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) People eat dinner, then they eat dessert, then they go to bed chewing on something. I mean, it's ridiculous. (laughs) But today... Sometime today, I want you to say, this is my last meal, or if you really want to start off really, really, really slow, I'm not going to watch TV after a certain time for 24 hours. Now, if if you don't watch TV anyway, don't do that. (laughs) I don't even have a TV. That was easy. (laughs) But let's do it with food. Uh, You know, like I said, let's hear some medical issues or concerns. But sometime today, say, this is my last meal, and for 24 hours, and you can go to the same time tomorrow, but if you really want to really do it, stop sometime today and don't eat again until Tuesday morning. And here's the, here's the goal. You have to say, I'm not going to eat, and instead I'm going to spend time with God. Now, will you be hungry? Yeah, one day is really kind of a hard, you know, you don't get the full experience, so don't think, wow, you know, that was... But it's really just for just so we can get everybody fasted together and praying. And let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray for our church. Let's pray God provide us a building, provide us the money for the building, the land, or whatever. Let's pr- let's pray for that. Now, the day after Christmas, which is a week from tomorrow. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Man, Christmas is next week. Huh? Wow. A week from Tuesday. Christmas is Monday? Yes, yes. The day after Christmas is Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> day after Christmas, if you want to go on a longer fast, that's the day we're going to start. Okay? Now, if you want to go a week, you don't have to tell anybody what you're going to do. But today is just, a, I just want to do a day today because we're, we're here talking about it and it's fresh in your mind, and you, you know. But for all of us who want to go longer, if you want to go, Two, three, 10, 20, 30, 40 days. The day after Christmas will be our day. Okay, is that, is that cool? If whoever wants to do it. And that day, we're going to eat fruit and vegetables for three or four days. And you can eat fruit and vegetables for the whole time. We're going to kind of cleanse ourselves out and whatever you, is good for you to clean you out. And a lot of water, a lot of juices all the time. Anyway, and then we're going to go. And if you go into the new year, you know, January 2nd, you can walk around and say, I haven't eaten all year. I'm a man. I'm spiritual. But again, this is not something you're going to go brag to people about. This is something you're going to try to keep as private as possible. People will find out. It doesn't blow your blessing, but you just don't go around going, oh, poor me, oh, poor me. That's what Jesus is talking about. Okay, so today, are we all on board for today? Okay, here's all. I want to pray for the church. Now, when we pray for the church, we're going to pray for each other, pray for each other because a lot of us are going to be struggling. You're going to be going to bed tonight going, oh, I can't make it. I pray for each other. So, you know, don't, don't punk out. And then if you wake up in the morning, just keep going until uh, Tuesday morning or whenever you want to do it. And again, if you have medical issues, and I'm saying this again, please don't do it if you have any medical, medical concerns. Um, but, uh, Lord, we just pray that you protect all of us and that you would really speak to us and that you will honor the faith that we are going to exercise as we fast. And we pray that you would empower our time, that as we fast, we would spend that extra time 
praying. We would spend that extra time seeking you, reading your word. Thank you, Jesus. Just for the opportunity to pray to you. And Lord, as we look to next year, I pray that we would be people of prayer and the word, prayer and fasting. That we would be useful to you as a light on a hill. In Jesus' name, amen.